Good afternoon, and welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation's Meet the Scientists monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation, and your host for today's webinar. Today, Dr. Holly Schwartz will present Psychosocial Interventions for Maternal Depression, Impact on School-Aged Children. The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation is committed to alleviating the suffering caused by mental illness by awarding grants that will lead to advances and breakthroughs in scientific research. The foundation is the largest private funder of mental health research grants. Since 1987, the foundation has awarded $380 million to fund more than 5,500 grants to more than 4,500 scientists around the world. 100% of all donor contributions for research are invested in our grants to scientists who are working to find breakthroughs in disorders such as addiction, ADHD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression, eating disorder, OCD, PTSD, and schizophrenia. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Holly Schwartz. Dr. Schwartz is professor of psychiatry at University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. She is also a 2006 recipient of a Foundation Young Investigator grant. Today's webinar will begin with Dr. Schwartz's presentation. This will be followed by a question and answer period. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab on the control panel on your screen. Feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation. I will present as many of the questions to Dr. Schwartz and we will address as many as possible in the time allotted. And now, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Holly Schwartz. Holly, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bornstein, um, and to the uh, Foundation for inviting me uh, to speak today. Um, the NARSAT funding was really important in my career development and I'm really delighted uh, to be able to talk about this, this study today. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about uh, some research that we've done looking at psychosocial interventions for maternal depression and uh, the impact on, on school age children. Um, I want to begin with uh, some, some acknowledgments because of course this work uh, uh, takes a village uh, and so I want to begin by thanking my many co-investigators and uh, research staff uh, and um, uh, the funding agency NIMH uh, and also most importantly the families who have participated in this research. Uh, here are my uh, current disclosures. Um, what I hope to do today is uh, talk first about the rationale for focusing on what we call very high-risk families, and I'll talk more about that, but um, essentially uh, we define this group as uh, depressed mothers um, and their, their school-age children who are currently experiencing themselves a psychiatric disorder. Uh, and then we'll talk about the role of psychosocial interventions in addressing maternal depression uh, and the potential for psychosocial interventions uh, focused on maternal depressions um, impacting both mothers and uh, their offspring. And we'll describe, then I'll describe uh, what we call the MOM study, uh, a, a study that has tested some hypotheses around these issues, and then uh, talk about some future directions. So I probably don't need to explain to those of you who are listening in today that maternal depression really is a public health emergency. So we know that depression is uh, associated with tremendous morbidity and mortality, uh, and it is a very common disorder, but it disproportionately affects women. So we know that approximately 20% or one out of five women will experience an episode of depression in her lifetime. So that's a huge, huge number of people, a huge, huge number of women. And as, as we know, about two-thirds of women are also mothers. So um, women, 
burdened with depression who are also caring for children. Um, and so this is just an enormous public health problem. Um, and to compound the problem, um, when, when parents are, are depressed, their, their children um, are then uh, themselves at risk for psychiatric disorders. So, so for both what we call internalizing and externalizing disorders. So internalizing disorders would be things like depression and anxiety, and externalizing disorders would be things like um, ADHD or um, uh, oppositional defiant disorder. And the increased risk is, is huge. So um, uh, somewhere between twice and five times the risk compared to um, kids whose parents are not suffering from de depression. So this is, these are they're very, very high risk families. Um, so we think about risk um, uh, in kind of a, a tiered fashion. So we know that um, families where um, one one generation has a psychiatric disorder um, is, is, is certainly a high-risk family. Um, by definition, the, the, the offspring are themselves then at risk for, um, for psychiatric disorders. So this is an area where um, intervention is certainly indicated. Uh, but we've chose to, chosen to focus on what we call very high-risk families. Um, so these are families where, um, where risk has already been instantiated in the second generation. So um, this is where um, moms are suffering from depression and their kids have already been diagnosed with a psychiatric disorder. So I want to make it clear that I am 100% in favor of early intervention and prevention. Um, I, I definitely think that that's the way to go, but unfortunately, we're not there yet. And the truth of the matter is we have a lot of families who are struggling with two generations um, who have psychiatric challenges. And so it's really important that we learn how to intervene and support these families. And so um, that is where we've been focusing. And we, we talk about these as very high risk families because um, they're at very high risk for poor outcomes. So in these families, the impact of maternal depression is um, compounded um, by the fact that uh, the kids are struggling themselves. So when kids are struggling with their uh, with psychiatric illness, having a mother who is depressed actually exacerbates or worsens the child's course of illness. Um, when the kids get treatment, which is important, having a depressed Mo uh, um, mother is associated with worse outcomes. So even getting um, good treatment, as long as um, mom remains depressed, uh, it, it is associated with the, the child not responding to even, even good treatment. Um, and some studies by uh, Myrna Weissman and colleagues um, suggest that, that these children continue um, it, it, it doesn't affect them only in childhood, it continues to have enduring consequences well into adulthood associated with worse psychiatric course of illness in adulthood um, and worse uh, psychosocial functioning. So when we talk about very high risk, we're talking about at, at very high risk for, for poor outcomes. Um, this is compounded by the fact that it's, it's, it's really hard to get the right treatment in to these high need families. So it, it probably doesn't come as a shock to, to any of us. It's just super hard for these moms um, to, to get care for the whole family. I mean, mom's feeling terrible um, and really overwhelmed and she's got kids and it's usually more than one kid um, who is struggling and she's got a really often the burden falls on her um, to figure out how to get treatment for everybody and not surprisingly it's really hard for moms to manage all of that so it's difficult for moms who are suffering from depression to get um, their their kids engaged in treatment but probably more importantly there's very low rates of treatment seeking for mothers um, because what moms do um, and one might argue what many women do is put their own treatment, their own needs last. So what moms do is say, gosh, I have such limited energy. I'm going to put 
that, that amount of energy that I've got, I'm going to put it into getting kids treatment for my kids. I have absolutely nothing left over for myself. You know, just I'm going to skip it. Um, but that that backfires because, as I said a few minutes ago, um, if mom doesn't get uh, better, the kids don't do do well. But the truth of the matter is, these these very very high risk families um, struggle because um, the kids often don't get into treatment, but um, actually uh, what what rarely happens is mom, mom, or what typically happens is mom does not get into treatment. Um, but here, here, here's the, the good news here, that if we can get mom into treatment, um, good things happen. So let's start with the high-risk families. So these are the families where mom is depressed and kids may or may not have psychiatric uh, disorders. So these are kids who are at risk for illness um, but are not yet um, uh, do not yet have disorders themselves. And so, as it turns out, when you treat these at-risk families, um, treating maternal depression with antidepressant medication does have an indirect positive influence on at-risk children. And so these data come from both observational studies as well as from one randomized trial. Um, uh, and these are uh, Myrna Weissman's group and uh, Judy Garber's group um, showing uh, the observational studies have shown that um, when mom's depressions remit um, that uh, kids then have a, a lower prevalence of psychiatric disorders and actually fewer psychiatric symptoms than um, the offspring of the moms who don't remit. Um, most of these studies, again, I said were done with antidepressants. That maternal depression treatment was with antidepressants. Um, Judy Garber's study was actually kind of a usual care model, which included some some psychotherapy, um, but medication uh, management primarily. And then um, a uh, there was one randomized trial done by Myrna Weissman's group, which compared three different psychopharmacology uh, strategies, so escitalopram versus bupropion versus the combination of these two medications. Um, and again, the good news was that improvement in maternal depression um, symptoms was related to improvement in child depression symptoms. Um, and these are in at-risk families, but it was actually only in mothers who got escitalopram, um, and they uh, found that this was mediated by an improvement in, um, in parenting. So um, this was this is good news, um, but it also raised some questions for us. So um, you know, one of the questions is, you know, in a, in very high risk families, would similar interventions have an impact on moms and on kids? Um, and and what about psychotherapy? And I'll talk in a minute about why we thought that might be important uh, to look at. Specifically, and you know, sort of the million-dollar question: What is the, what are the mechanisms driving um, these these reciprocal relationships between mothers and children? So let me talk about why we were interested in psychotherapy, um, <laughs> and the reason we we're interested in it is because that's what moms told us they wanted. Um, so it's pretty clear that women um, who suffer from mood disorders actually prefer psychotherapy to medication. Um, uh, probably, uh, you know, over, well, certainly more than, they prefer psychotherapy um, twice as much as medication, probably a threefold preference to psycho for psychotherapy over medication. Um, this is probably st stronger in women during their childbearing years, um, which isn't to say that um, medication can't be used safely during the childbearing years, but um, in terms of a patient, pr patient preference, uh, women do prefer psychotherapy. Um, and so uh, that's really an important consideration. Um, and actually, we know that psychosocial interventions work. So um, the, this slide shows the results of a meta-analysis um, that was conducted by Tim Coopers and colleagues in the Netherlands. Um, and they, sh they showed uh, that there was you know, a moderate, a pretty good effect size, um, pooled effect size of psychological treatments for maternal depression. Now, the caveat for this meta-analysis is that um, there were eight trials included in the meta-analysis, and seven of them um, were with um, women who were experiencing postpartum depression um, or basically had very young children. So these were not very high-risk families, and, and they were basically um, not school-age kids. These were really kind of a, a different population than we're focused on, but still it, it was 
encouraging. The, the one trial that was really relevant to what we're talking about here is actually a study that was conducted by our research group here and formed the essentially the pilot data for the study that I'm going to be talking about. We um, conducted a study uh, in very high-risk families um, comparing interpersonal psychotherapy to uh, a referral for treatment as usual. And we um, did indeed find that that, uh, that IPT or interpersonal psychotherapy um, uh, had a, was, a, was efficacious for treating maternal depression and had a positive effect on child outcomes as well. Um, but there, had, there have been no studies up um, until this point uh, comparing active psychotherapies um, uh, for uh, very high-risk families that targeted maternal depression. Um, the other thing that really hadn't has been addressed um, in this context is um, barriers to treating maternal uh, depression in the context of, of very high-risk families. And um, as I've talked about, um, depressed mothers um, of children in mental health treatment have uh, a lot of difficulty engaging in their own mental health treatment. Um, and uh, the idea of incorporating some work uh, around engagement into psychosocial intervention seem to make a lot of sense because um, moms are struggling not only with being overwhelmed by their own uh, mental health needs and, and those of their uh, kids, but they're also struggling with uh, issues around stigma, um, custody, concerns that if they've got a psychiatric illness that someone's going to take their kids away from them, um, and the whole issue of, of health services delivery. So, you know, when, you know, in the United States, uh, maternal and, and child mental health services most often are, are really fragmented. So you've got to go to one place to get your kids treated and go to a completely different place and different provider to get your own needs met. Um, and, of course, uh, you know, practical limitations around um, time and money um, and, and, and barriers, practical barriers to, to care. Um, so our, our goal in the study that I'm going to talk about was um, to evaluate the effects of two brief psychosocial interventions for maternal depression in very high-risk families and look at the impact on maternal outcomes and on child outcomes. Um, and this is a very busy slide, um, but this is the, um, the con what we call the consort diagram um, showing uh, participant flow. Um, the citation for the study, which has been published, is um, uh, on the bottom right. The, uh, I guess I can use my pointer. Yeah, here it is. Um, the journal, um, uh, the Journal of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, was published in 2016. Um, uh, so, so a couple things that are important to know. We, we actually recruited in child mental health settings. So again, as I mentioned, moms are not generally coming in for treatment. So we, we used what we call bottom-up sampling, which means we, we worked with uh, child mental health providers to identify moms who were bringing kids in for care. Um, we were focused on school-age kids, so kids age 7 to 18 who um, were experiencing current or recent, but really virtually everybody had current um, internalizing uh, disorder that was diagnosed with a structured clinical interview and who were currently receiving mental health treatment. Um, moms uh, met criteria for a current episode of major depressive disorder according to the DSM-4 on a structured clinical interview and also were at least moderately depressed on um, a symptom inventory for depression. Um, children were uh, continued to receive care openly in, in the community mental health settings, the child, child mental health settings, um, and mothers were randomized to receive nine sessions of either um, a modified form of interpersonal psychotherapy that we called IPT moms or brief supportive psychotherapy, which we called DSP, um, over three months. And then we followed both moms and kids. So we assessed the dyads. Um, and let's see here. So we basically ended up randomizing 174 dyads. And we followed um, them at three months, six months, nine months, and 12 months. Um, I want to tell you just a little bit about the interventions themselves. So um, the IPT MOMS intervention um, consisted of one session focused on treatment engagement. So remember, these are not treatment-seeking MOMS. We're basically 
you know, sort of they're being screened in their in their child's clinics, and we're saying, hey, can we? Are you interested in something that might be helpful for you? Um, and so, uh, really, sort of exploring barriers to to, to depression treatment engagement, um, and um, then eight sessions of a a, a brief form of IPT, that's what the B stands for, brief, um, that include a specific set of strategies directed towards core issues facing um, depressed moms with uh, psychiatrically ill kids. Um, IPT is an evidence-based psychotherapy, um, very well-established efficacy for depression. Um, there's lots of information out there available. Just very, very briefly, it, it looks at the link between moods and interpersonal events uh, or interpersonal relationships, uh, and it focuses on uh, improving symptoms and improving uh, social functioning. Uh, and in IPT, we uh, typically pick one of four problem areas, and again, this is the standard model. Again, I have some of the references down here if you want to learn more about IPT. Um, Gerald Clerman and Myrna Weissman developed it in the 1970s. Um, the, role, the problem areas um, include a role transition, which means a shift from one social role to another, like uh, going from uh, being a, a single person to being a parent, that, or going from being employed to being unemployed. A role dispute means a, a disagreement with somebody important to you. Grief is what it sounds like when you've lost somebody important to you, and interpersonal deficits is when you've um, had a long-standing difficulty of interpersonal functioning. And and the, and the psychotherapy typically would focus on one of these four problem areas and their specific strategies associated with each one of them. Um, for IPT moms, we actually um, added a, another problem area. Um, which we called parenting an ill child, uh, based on our work with these families, um, we we thought of it as a, a kind of a role transition. So, um, although moms were used to the idea of being a parent, it, it came as a bit of a shock for many moms that there were additional challenges associated with what it what was required to parent a, a child who was was struggling with a psychiatric disorder and. Um, uh, here are some of the specific goals, and these uh, are sort of structured the way that we structure IPT uh, goals. Um, so mourning the old role, which um, in this case was, was conceptualized as parenting, quote, a normal child. That's a terrible word, but it really refers to um, what they had expected, the kind of parenting uh, that they had expected to do before their child was diagnosed, um, and normalizing some of the ambivalence associated with this role um, and helping them uh, develop mastery of the new role and, and address issues around um, uh, maternal maternal guilt. Um, and one of the things that we really focused on also was um, really trying to alleviate um, uh, blame. Uh, so a lot of moms came into this feeling like somehow everybody was saying that it was their fault. Um, and, uh, of course, it was really important that we framed this, that moms um, could be part of the solution, um, uh, but that, uh, that it, it was not their fault that their, ch their child was, was struggling with this, that this was um, a biologic uh, disorder, um, and that uh, they could be helpful in, in um, helping their child uh, function better, but that it, it certainly wasn't their fault. Um, the other thing that was really important, and I, I can't think, I mean, how many times I said this, uh, the, this little um, sort of cartoon strip at the bottom is the sort of airplane um, strip, which is you got to put um, your, the oxygen mask on yourself before helping somebody else, which is you got to help, you got to take care of yourself before you can really be effective um, or be, be the kind of mom that you want to be and, and help help your kids as effectively as you would like. So a lot of work on prioritizing self-care, building social supports, uh, finding ways to really positively connect with the child, um, and also something that was important, tolerating uncertainties associated with the child's course and prognosis. Um, Brief supportive therapy is actually um, a manualized psychotherapy as well, uh, uh, rooted in Rogerian client-centered uh, psychotherapy. 
Um, there is very good evidence for efficacy. Um, it differs from IPT in that it's not directive. It really focuses on, um, on patient strengths um, and has uh, been found to be effective across a, uh, uh, multiple disorders, including depression. Um, it, it allows the patient to set the therapy agenda, uses things like reflected list, listening, open-ended questions, a real focus on exploration of affect and providing empathic support. And I think um, a, a really important distinction between IPT and VSP is that um, in VSP, uh, we don't provide a specific framework for explaining or for um, resolving the patient's distress. And this is just a little um, table uh, uh, for explaining some do's and don'ts for VSP. So um, it is really an emotionally um, charged psychotherapy with affect that encourages catharsis, um, builds a strong alliance between the patient and the therapist. It's very strength-based, but it's not a problem-solving kind of psychotherapy. Um, and of course, it's not a transference-focused therapy, and there is not homework. Um, it says, don't give up or the patient will too. So it's really kind of a very a very positive um, intervention. One thing I, I want to stress that we did for all the, um, for both psychotherapies, we, we used a lot of nonspecific strategies to engage these families. So things like um, using flexible scheduling, um, we would, when possible, we would try to meet moms at their child's appointment. Um, that didn't always work for lots of different reasons. Um, we would use phone sessions uh, if needed. So we allowed up to two-thirds of the uh, psychotherapy sessions to occur over the phone. Um, we pretty much avoided using the word depressed, um, even though uh, moms had to meet criteria for a major depressive disorder. We usually use the word overwhelmed. That was much more tended to really resonate with this population. Um, and we would work with child providers to help us track down moms who were, quote, MIA or missing in action. Again, um, trying to engage this population really uh, took kind of a, uh, a, a, a big effort um, because, again, this is a population that, that's really struggling. Um, so these, this is now starting to get into some of the data. So um, uh, this is uh, the... Uh, actually um, intent to treat a sample. There were 168 moms, um, and what you can see is moms were um, around 45 years old. Um, it uh, was a predominantly uh, white sample. This reflects the demographics of the city of Pittsburgh, where the work was carried out. It was actually a very um, heterogeneous group in terms of socially uh, SES, so um, we had families that were homeless as well as university professors. Um, so there was a, a lot of a variety in, in terms of, there was a lot of diversity in terms of SES. Um, they, uh, we did allow individuals who were on antidepressants to enter the study if they came in uh, on a stable dose of medication for at least um, a month and agreed to remain on that dose um, for the uh, active phase of the treatment. Um, and you can see there were high rates of uh, anxiety, comorbidity, um, and this was a, a pretty, uh, about 45% uh, 40, had a recurrent major depressive disorder. Um, these are the demographics of the, of the kids. Um, so um, the mean age was around 14. We had more, slightly more girls than boys. And um, a, a little bit less than a half also, so they were required to have at least one internalizing diagnosis to enter the study, so that would be a current depressive disorder or an anxiety disorder, but um, close to a half also met criteria for an externalizing disorder. Um, and uh, as you can see, um, about half of the sample were currently receiving um, medications, which were mostly uh, antidepressants. So these are the kids receiving open treatment. Um, these are the outcomes. So um, these are mom's outcomes. So these are mom's depression scores. And what you can see is that um, mom got, moms got better. Um, and there were no differences between psychotherapies. Um, so you can see an abrupt decline, which is an improvement in Hamilton scores um, from the baseline to 
um, the three-month follow-up, which is the end of the acute phase, and then these gains were maintained um, out to the 12-month follow-up period. And what you can see here, there was a significant effect for time, but there were actually no differences between there was no time by group interaction, so there were no differences between BSP and IPT moms. Um, and this is the child depression inventory, and we essentially saw um, essentially the same idea here, um, where the kids got better um, over time, um, and there were no differences between groups. We did control for um, child treatment, so number of child visits as well as um, child medication. Um, and uh, this, uh, and we saw, uh, nevertheless, saw an improvement in child depression scores and um, also in uh, this measure of functioning. So this is a Columbia impairment scale where we saw the same pattern, um, uh, significant improvement over time, but no difference between between uh, psychotherapies. Um, I think it's important to know that actually the, m most of the moms stayed with us for the psychotherapies and got um, what we defined as um, an adequate di dose of psychotherapy, which was six or more sessions, um, which we were pretty proud of. Again, this is not, I just can't I mean, again, as I've mentioned multiple times, this is not a treatment-seeking group, um, and so o over 80% in both in both psychotherapies um, uh, received adequate uh, exposure to the interventions. Um, and although the um, both psychotherapies were um, essentially the same in terms of uh, symptomatic outcomes, moms liked the IPT moms better than the BSP. So on measures of satisfaction, uh, IPT moms uh, scored better than BSP. And we saw that anecdotally. So some moms were kind of frustrated with the BSP. Um, so even though they got better, they, were, um, they, they wanted more direction. They wanted more problem solving. They wanted us to help them um, manage their relationship with their kids. Um, they wanted more direction on how to interface more effectively with their um, ch children's uh, health services. Um, so they they preferred IPT moms, although both both interventions uh, uh, helped them get better. The other thing that we thought was interesting is that um, um, that although there were no differences in terms of outcomes between the the kids uh, of moms who got BSP or IPT moms, um, the 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 kids who got BSP um, used more services to get to the same endpoint, so they were more likely to use medication. Um, so um, there was there was significantly more medication use in the BSP group, and they had more um, outpatient mental health visits than the IPT um, moms group. So they got to the same place, but it required more services on the child end um, to get there. Um, this is a very busy slide and um, uh, very hard to read, but I, I just kind of want to point this out. Um, this, this is um, a, a therapy adherence rating scale. So we were pretty fastidious about making sure that the therapists were doing what they were supposed to be doing. So we audio taped um, the therapy sessions and then we had um, trained raters go back and listen to the sessions um, and, and, and rate them um, and making sure that they were doing what they were supposed to be doing. And what this shows um, is the stars mean that, they, that the therapies were significantly different on all these different items. Um, so sort of the take home message is that the therapies were different. They were significantly different on, 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 on all these different scales that tell you what, what the therapists were doing. But the one that was not different is the, here, I think I can show you with my pointer here, this facilitative conditioning, this one. So they were identical and high. Um, and so what's interesting is that that item basically measures therapist warmth and empathy. Um, so those include things like um, was the therapist empathic towards the client? Um, did the therapist convey an intimate understanding um, of and sensitivity to the client's experience and feeling? So, ba so basically, um, these so in both therapies, the um, these are kind of the non-specific factors of psychotherapy. Um, but the, the therapists um, were 
were warm and empathic in both psychotherapy conditions. So um, we, we don't necessarily know what were the active ingredients in these psychotherapies, but um, we believe that at least in part being warm and empathic com uh, contributed um, to uh, the overall positive effects of, of both of these in interventions. Um, so I'm just uh, changing gears a little bit. So, so we know that um, that moms got better with both interventions, and that uh, kids got better as well. Um, but I want, but what is the relationship between mom outcomes and kid outcomes? So I, I want to call your attention to um, the shape of these curves. So these are the mom's depression scores, and these are the child impairment scores. I'm focusing on impairment here because they were a little bit more robust than the depression scores. But um, what you can see is they, the shape of these curves look different. So moms have an abrupt decline and then stay well. The kids, there's a more gradual slope to this. Um, and so what we actually found when we applied statistical analyses to this is that, um, that there was actually a lag um, in there was an association between maternal um, depression outcomes and child outcomes, but there was, an, there was a lagged association um, between these two things. So I mean, here you can just sort of see it graphically, and here I'll show you the statistical analyses. Um, so actually, there was no what we call concurrent association um, between maternal outcomes and, and child outcomes. So this is the child depression inventory, the um, strengths and difficulties questionnaire, which is another child measure, and this is the Columbia impairment scale. Um, um, but where, where this was significant, was it was sort of borderline significant for the SDQ, um, and it, was, it reached statistical significance for the uh, 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 Columbia impairment scale, was really at six months. So um, what we, we found was that the um, when, when we look at the statistically significant relationship between um, uh, maternal depression outcomes and child outcomes, um, the, the relationship was lagged. So basically, moms get better first, and then kids get better. And this, this makes some sense to us, um, um, especially if what is maybe meeting, mediating this is something um, about the relationship between moms and kids, that kind of moms get their act together and that this might have then a downstream positive effect on their, on their kids and then the positive effects start to kick in, but it, it takes a little while. Um, and one thing that um, we're sort of exploring right now, um, this actually um, doesn't show up in the, in the main paper, it's something that we've um, published some abstracts on, but we're working on right now. So one of the things that has been really interesting to us is the differences between those without externalizing diagnoses and those with externalizing diagnoses. They actually end up being um, pretty different populations. So the those with externalizing diagnoses tend to be, the kids are younger, the moms are younger, they're more likely to be boys, um, uh, they, they have more impairment, um, and uh, so as it turns out, the relationship, the lagged relationship is stronger, is more robust actually for kids with internalizing disorders only. Um, and so, uh, you know, as we start to sort of break these groups apart, um, the, 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 there may be sort of different processes happening when um, uh, kids have both internalizing diagnoses and externalizing diagnoses. Um, and this kind of gets into, you know, sort of what, what is, what is um, you know, what's the factor that, that, that's driving this? What are the mediators? And, and I think um, many groups are, are really interested in the role of, of parenting. And I think Judy Garber's group has shown that, um, again, in, in, in high-risk families, that change in parental depressive symptoms um, predicted uh, change in depressive symptoms, and this, that this was um, uh, partially mediated by uh, improved parental acceptance on a parenting measure. Um, and Myrna Weissen's group uh, in the randomized trial of uh, of three antidepressant strategies um, found that the differential effects um, where only escitalopram showed an effect on, uh, on uh, 
child outcomes was partially explained by increases in maternal care and affection on a uh, parenting measure. And we also in the, have shown that um, uh, in the group where children have internalizing diagnoses only, improvement in positive parenting um, mediates the improvement in, in child depressive symptoms. So, um, you know, this, this may be um, uh, the kind of uh, factor that is, is driving the relationship between um, uh, mother and, and child outcomes. Um, so, uh, just starting to wrap up here, I think uh, as we're looking towards the future, um, we're certainly in, uh, really interested in trying to understand um, what some of the mediators are, um, so what are the factors that explain the relationship between maternal and child outcomes, so we're interested in looking at some of these parenting variables. We're also uh, in, our, in our lab looking at um, some physiologic factors that um, are associated with uh, uh, child and maternal um, risk and also resilience, um, and I, you know, I think we also need to start thinking about more dyadic interventions that um, uh, address the needs of these very high-risk families uh, as we as we move forward. Um, so, uh, just to start to wrap up, um, of course, there are many limitations to a study like this. Um, uh, it's important to, to note that we did not have an inactive comparator, so it's impossible to know if um, uh, the changes that we're seeing with these psychotherapies were um, uh, part of uh, a regression to the mean or um, just the natural course of illness um, rather than the effect of the psychotherapies themselves. Um, we were proud of our, our engagement um, of the of these families, uh, given the fact that they were not treatment seeking. But still, we had relatively high attrition, 27% um, over uh, 12 months. The finding that um, the that the children in um, the IPT moms group uh, had lower utilization of psychiatric services in terms of number of visits and uh, medications um, um, may actually uh, have resulted from um, m mothers not actually seeking services for their kids um, uh, instead of the interpretation that we put forward that um, it was resulting from decreased need for services um, although we sort of you know do want to point out that the in terms of the symptomatic outcomes the the kids did just as well as the kids in the BSP group and it's important to note that the fathers were not ass assessed uh, we do this you know, and fathers certainly play an important role um, in these families, um, and uh, we do not have that information uh, for for this study. So I just want to you know summarize by reminding um, us that um, this is a very high risk uh, population, but we also um, uh, can think of this as a as a potentially very high yield population. That if we can um, uh, develop interventions that work, we have the potential to um, affect not only one generation but two generations, um, and that this has significant public health implications. Um, we. Uh, this, I think, establishes that psychotherapy can be used to treat uh, maternal depression in very high-risk families. And the good news um, is that both IPT moms and BSP um, work, and that it treats maternal depression and has downstream effects on, on kids. Um, but it's important to note that moms actually prefer the IPT moms, and this might have um, some longer-term effects in terms of uh, keeping moms in, engaged in, in therapy. Um, we were able to show um, an improvement in, that, in maternal depression it, um, that it is associated with uh, an improvement in child functioning, but that it's lagged so that um, there's uh, a, a three to six month um, lag between uh, maternal improvement and, and child improvement, and that this is actually even more pronounced in those with just internalizing diagnoses. Um, I you know can't stress enough that this is these families are are hard to recruit to engage to retain and that really speaks to how overwhelmed they are um, and so you know this is a group that really requires outreach in multiple domains in order to address their needs um, and I think from a clinical standpoint um, you know I think the good news is that that psychotherapies help that it helps the moms it helps the kids but it's important to remember that we're going to expect a three to six month delay in um, child improvement so I think we need to plan um, to provide families 
moms with some extra support during this time period, help moms understand that it's going to take a little bit of time for um, kids to see the benefit of their improvement um, and provide, uh, perhaps provide ancillary services for kids um, uh, during this time period to maybe even shorten, shorten the delay. Um, so with that, I'll wrap up um, and uh, say thank you for, for your attention. Holly, uh, thank you for an excellent presentation and really very important work. Um, certainly, you mentioned the issue of prevention. This, is, this really gets to prevention of further illness or even development of illness potentially in, in, um, in the second generation um, and certainly can have a tremendous impact in people who are at high risk. So thank you for uh, the work that you're doing. I want to ask you a little bit more about engaging these families because obviously that was one of the issues you highlighted that um, these people who are under such stress, it could often be hard to engage them. I want to say a little bit more about steps that you see as, as ways to um, help that engagement in the treatment process. Um, so we have developed um, actually a specific engagement intervention that is based on principles of motivational interviewing and ethnography where we really, um, uh, and this is work that I've done with my colleagues Nancy Grote from the University of Washington and um, Alan Zukoff who's an expert in motivational interviewing, um, and, and the I, you know, the, the um, sort of framework for the engagement session is to um, First of all, really try to understand mom's dilemma or story, really taking her perspective um, to understand what her priorities are and sort of her perspective on uh, um, on what she wants help with and why she wants help. Um, also to understand her prior negative experiences with um, with with other agencies and with um, other um, uh, sources of of, um, of of treatment in the past, and I, I sort of use treatment um, in quotes because uh, it might be actually treatment for herself or treatment for her kids or other other agencies. And a lot of times, um, families have had really negative experiences, whether it might be with um, uh, child use and family or, uh, um, uh, encounters, or it might be with welfare agencies, but really to understand what some of the negative experiences have been and to really um, validate those experiences. So this is, you know, partly kind of the ethnographic stance to, to, to really understand her perspective and take sort of the one down position and be a, a learner. Um, and, and then to sort of systematically explore barriers to treatment seeking. So to understand um, uh, psychological barriers, um, uh, 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 cultural uh, and racial barriers uh, to treatment seeking and put those right out on the table and pull for them uh, if mom doesn't sort of um, uh, um, offer them herself um, and 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 practical barriers but honestly practical barriers sometimes are um, the not the easiest to overcome but uh, are most easily offered by mom um, uh, they're important to address as well, but uh, I think exploring some of the psychological and cultural barriers to treatment seeking are not always addressed and, and, and need to be explored. So um, we use kind of a motivational en uh, interviewing sort of set of strategies and techniques to kind of elicit this information and, and, and uh, review it with her, but uh, you know, covering some of those, those points. So I think, I think really at attending directly to the engagement process is, is critically important before trying to jump in and, and, and provide treatment. Um, very, very good explanation and obviously important to engage people in, in, in whatever situation they're in to get them into treatment. I like very much the uh, the use of the slot, the cartoon of on the airplane. Um, you know, make sure you get oxygen before you give oxygen to to the child. Um, yeah. I think that's a very, really, very good point. Um, as you see this work going forward, um, do you see it um, having an impact, or what kind of impact do you see it having on groups that aren't at such a high risk, but certainly could potentially benefit? from these interventions? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, uh, my 
colleague, um, uh, Laura Dietz, here at the University of Pittsburgh, has developed um, a dietic intervention for um, for pre uh, for um, for um, uh, pre adolescent kids and their moms. So this is kind of the um, you know sort of the dyadic kind of approach that I was uh, talking about. So um, uh, and using you know uh, intervening earlier um, in in the pipeline and, and trying to um, provide families with supports earlier on. Um, you know I think you know pr primary prevention is always you know really important. Um, uh, there has been work done, of course, with um, uh, women uh, with perinatal depression um, and helping moms who are depressed, uh, you know, uh, around parenting uh, issues even before their kids are, you know, while their, um, you know, kids are, uh, are, are babies. I think that, you know, there's a lot of data to support, of course, those kinds of interventions as well. So I think, um, you know, getting these families early is, is certainly um, worthwhile. The, I, I want to ask you a little bit more about the uh, increase in positive parenting um, and what what types of um, interventions in general can help with that positive parenting approach, um, really, you know, educating mothers and obviously potentially fathers, but in this case mothers, um, the, the types of things that can have a positive impact. Well, you know, that's a great question, and I'm not sure I have a, a good answer for that, but I think that's another direction to go in, because it wasn't decrease in negative parenting, it was increase in positive parenting that seemed to make a difference. So I, I, I think... Um, uh, I, I think trying to come up with some strategies that focus on positivity, um, you know, m might be an, another way to go. Um, and um, you know, I think helping moms. Uh, so one of the things that we have done um, is helping moms and kids establish um, a positive connection with each other. So a lot of times these families have um, gotten sort of stuck in these sort of negative traps of, um, you know, being angry at each other. These kind of um, bl blaming stances where everybody's sort of angry at each other. And you know, the truth of the matter is everybody's really struggling and um, helping families um, and moms in particular work to understand, uh, to find those points of positive connection, um, whether it would be, you know, uh, you know, working, you know, to helping mom to, you know, rediscover the kinds of things that uh, she enjoyed doing with her kids before, um, before their kids got sick, whether that would be, um, you know, going to the mall or going to a movie or taking a walk in the park. So, you know, sort of identifying um, points of positive connection and sort of um, helping um, underscore uh, 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 opportunities for 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 positive connection um, as as a basis for um, enhancing um, positive relationships and then building on that to to talk about positive parenting strategies. But I think it has to come. Um, uh, uh, move from uh, uh, a positive relationship uh, first um, and build on top of that uh, positive parenting strategies. Okay. I want to ask you if there's somebody um, listening to this webinar right now who has a school-aged child with depression or anxiety. Um, what should they do? Um, well, so the first thing to do is take time for yourself, um, and I think that a lot of um, moms say, "Are you kidding? I can't. I don't even have a second in the day." But the choice, the truth of the matter is, um, you know, you you need, you know, again, we're going to go back to the cartoon about um, putting the oxygen mask on yourself first, and so, um, you know, tr you know, whether it means taking. Uh, you know, time to take a, a bath for a few minutes to, you know, that if that relaxes you, whether it might mean, um, you know, literally smelling the roses, taking time to just sit outside for a few minutes and um, ha have a few minutes of sort of mindfulness and enjoying a little bit of peace and quiet. It, it really is important every single day just to take a few minutes for yourself um, uh, because, because you deserve it and because honestly that's um, a path towards being the kind of parent that you want to be. Um, the next thing is, um, you know, continuing this theme of not putting yourself on the back burner. If you're struggling with 
um, your own mental health needs, it really is important for you to get help for yourself. Um, and that doesn't mean that you're taking time away from your kids. It means um, that you're doing right by them. Um, and uh, if that means that you know you don't have a home cooked meal on the table, um, so be it. It really means that you you know um, getting help for yourself is is uh, the right thing to do for yourself. But more importantly, it's the right thing to do for your family. The other thing is that I think so many moms struggle with um, feelings of guilt that somehow it's their fault. And I know this is really a confusing message because um, these illnesses do run in families. But the way I, I think it's important to think about this is we're all dealt kind of a genetic hand. Um, and, um, you know, we do pass our genes on to our kids. But, um, you know, none of us has a blank slate. None, I mean, none of us is born with absolutely perfect cholesterol, perfect blood pressure, no depression, no anxiety. So it's not about, you know, thinking that we're going to pass on to our kids like the perfect genome. Um, what we need to model for our kids is that is how we deal with it. Um, so it, uh, it's important not to blame ourselves for, um, you know, the, the genetics that we we pass along to our kids because nobody passes along absolutely pristine, perfect genetics. But I think what we want to think about is is modeling for our kids, you know, the, how we handle the hand that we are dealt. Um, and in some ways, you know, if if you struggle with depression and anxiety and your kid struggles with depression and anxiety, you're in a great position to be helpful to them because you're kind of an expert. And this then gets back to making sure that you get treatment for yourself because then you really are in a good position to help them figure out what they need to do to navigate um, this illness um, in their lives. Uh, so I think that, that those are the kinds of things that, that you can do for yourself and then ultimately that will be helpful for your kids. Yeah, I think your point about modeling taking care of yourself um, so that the, your child can follow that role model um, and modeling being able to be open and talking about um, your own issues of depression or anxiety so that your child might be more open about it and open to getting treatment is a very good um, way of thinking about it uh, so that both members of the family could get the, the care that they need and they deserve. Absolutely. Yeah. The, you know, I think to me, the, the, the most, one of the most important messages of this is the very positive message that treatment works and that by engaging in treatment, um, the both the mother and the child show significant improvement. And that's a, an extraordinary message of hope. Absolutely. So that's really, you know, the, a, a great, a, that's great news. Um, we can help families feel better and do better, you know, so not only, you know, did, did symptoms improve, but so did functioning. And so that's, you know, that's, that's great. And so we've got a lot to offer families. Well, Holly, I want to thank you again for taking the time to do this uh, excellent presentation, for the give and take and the, and the question and answers, and most importantly, for the ongoing work that you're doing, which is having an impact um, on, on the types of treatments available for people. So thank you very, very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, I also want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, all of the research we fund is made possible through private donations. So please consider making a contribution by visiting our website, bbrfoundation.org, or calling us at 1-800-829-8289. This webinar has been recorded. If you've missed any portion or would like to share it with a family member or a friend, please visit the events and webinars page on our website. I hope you'll join us again next month when Dr. Stephen Mata, the Daniel X. Friedman Professor of Psychiatry, Vice Chair for Education and Psychiatry, and Director of the Section on Psychosis at the Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior at UCLA, will present research updates improving functioning in schizophrenia. This will take place on Tuesday, November 14th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you again for joining us, and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.